it's the 13th, and you know in English culture, 13 is a very unlucky number of that. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Very, very warm welcome. My name is Gareth Richards from the Rubidine Bookshop. So together with the Fidei Institute, of course, most of you know, we are the joint organizers of these new Santana forums. Uh, just a couple of uh, things before we really begin proceedings tonight. Uh, a small in memoriam. Uh, many of you will know that earlier this week, uh, the late and very great Syed Zahari passed away in Singapore. Uh, oh, in KL. In KL. In KL. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Syed, he was uh, a leading Singapore based journalist in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, he very famously led a three-month-long strike uh, when he was the editor of Utusan uh, Malayu. It's kind of hard to believe that Utusan was once uh, a radical and progressive uh, newspaper, and certainly under science directorship it was. Um, and I was very privileged to edit the very last piece that he published, which was in the book that celebrated 50 years, or commemorated 50 years, after the notorious operation Cold Storm in Singapore in 1963, when basically Liu Kuan Yew liquidated the entire progressive forces of Singapore, and therefore set Singapore's political trajectory on a particular course. So we just remember uh, the contribution of uh, Syed Zahari uh, this evening. Um, <clears throat> Talking about people from the same generation, it's a song, isn't it? I'm talking about my generation. Anyway, not my generation, from that generation. Uh, see, I would forgot to mention, I don't know whether she's too shy to, but there's a special event which we will be organizing on the 8th of May. And she's just run away, so I think she's very shy. So, would, would you just like to say a few words about it? <laughs> Basically, on the 8th of May, we have the 4th Prime Minister of Malaysia, Tun Dr. Mahathir, coming to the night to deliver a talk on Poor Buddies Malaysia. So, uh, it will be in Street Ski Convention Centre, level 6, and it will start at 4 o'clock. Registration is highly recommended. That is so that we could arrange the chairs and Stuff. Accordingly, uh, that hall can fit 2,000, so bring as many people as you can. <laughs> so spread the word, the event is free. As you can see, although the flyer is a little small, but you can bring it home. You can bring it home and pass it around if you need to. Uh, the event details is all up on our website already. And the registration link is already open. And we really hope that it will be a very <coughs> View. I don't know. So, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Yes. And he's appearing on stage with? Uh, he's appearing on stage with Dr. Afif technically as his moderator, the Exco of Health for the State Government of Penang. Uh, before that, uh, CM would be there to deliver keynote speeches, uh, welcoming or opening, however you like to phrase it. So, CM would be there. Tun Mahathir will be there, his wife will be there. <laughs> Who else? Pardon? Actually, so that's something, something to look forward to. The jailer and the jailer. <laughs> uh, we'll, 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 we'll have it. They should have me as the moderator, but apparently I'm too immoderate to be a moderator for that particular yeah, session. The I'll be the MC if I've done it here. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a really, really great pleasure uh, to welcome tonight uh, two speakers, two very good friends. Uh, on my immediate left, probably not politically, but who knows, is Dr. Mustafa K. Angwan. Uh, Mus is uh, presently uh, heads up 
uh, a research unit at the Institute called, appropriately enough, the Nusantara Studies Research Area. So, most, as many of you know, uh, not long ago retired from uh, teaching at USM, where he specialised in communications studies. Is that right, Bruce? Yes, yeah, communication studies. Um, and now he makes trouble over at Jalan Brown uh, with uh, his one and only assistant, Din, sitting at the back for moral support. And uh, Moose will be today's discussant. And on his left, and I'm sure that is a political position, I'm very, very, very happy to welcome Professor Hans Dieter Effers. Hans and I have known each other for quite some time. I've had the privilege <coughs> of being his editor for a number of uh, publications. Um, Hans tells me he first came to Penang in 1959. So that probably predates all, most of your births. <laughs> Not looking at you in particular. Well, <laughs> 1959. And of course, when he first came from the, uh, you know, from, from the German Harvard as a young research student, it wasn't at all to Southeast Asia, but he came to Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and he did his research there, before drifting further with the currents across the Bay of Bengal, and of course becoming one of the leading social scientists. And I say social scientists because it's very hard to capture Hans's work in a simple disciplinary terms. A sociologist, I think, partly. I also like to, he also likes to say in a very modest way that he's the, he's the grandson, at least the intellectual grandson of Max Weber, the great Max Weber, because Max Weber's student was then Hans's supervisor. So he's only two generations removed from Weber, and that probably makes him about four generations removed from Marx. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Hans is currently uh, employed uh, by uh, ICMAS in uh, University of Kabaksa in Malaysia, but he's also had in recent years uh, positions at USM itself. And particularly, uh, we've got to know each other much better while he's been in the abode of peace, otherwise known as uh, Brunei Darul Salaam. Uh, at UBD, uh, where he's been uh, very, very proactive. I mean, Hans has written a tremendous amount, and you just need to do a search of him, and you'll find uh, an incredible variety, which shows some of, I think, his very protean and inquisitive mind. Uh, he did a book with two colleagues, including Solveig Gerg and his wife, six or seven years ago, on Penang and the Straits of Malacca book which is sadly out of print, but we're hoping to bring a new edition out at some point. Um, he's done work, very recent work, on knowledge hubs, including looking at Penang as a knowledge hub. So it's a very, very broad, wide uh, area of inquiry that Hans has engaged with over the years. And I think tonight's talk, uh, which is going to be published quite soon, in the Journal of the Malaysian Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society, GEMRAS, uh, will, I think, demonstrate the breadth and the depth of his learning and knowledge. He's, he's going to take you on a journey that passes from 14th century Java to Jakarta in January 2016. So please give a very, very warm Santoro welcome to Professor Hans. Well, thank you, Gareth, for these uh, usually very nice uh, uh, introductions. Uh, and uh, if anybody reads anything uh, that I have written and complains about my German type of English, he is responsible because I usually send my stuff to him and he does the copy editing. Now, just imagine, they have been running this show 13 times. Nusantara, not knowing what Nusantara is all about. So I think it's about time to take up this challenge and uh, see what sort of concept Nusantara really is. But let me uh, start with a 
personal uh, story. Now, <clears throat> I grew up uh, in Germany after the war uh, in Hanover. Now, if you have seen uh, photographs of Aleppo these days, Hanover looked pretty much like Aleppo nowadays, maybe worse. And during that time, um, I did what at uh, that time many boys did, and I started to collect stamps. Uh, the stamps of the British occupied zone, the American occupied, the French occupied zones, and all the different stamps. And then I suddenly came about a foreign stamp. And this was the stamp I collected. And I was sitting there in the bombed out shelter and seeing, oh, Malaya, Malaya. So this sort of term, Malaya, was always floating around my head. It captured my imagination, of course, stimulated by these nice pictures uh, on this uh, step from uh, around the 1950s, I guess. Well, uh, the imagination never left me, and that's why I'm standing here today. So I followed up. I traveled to Sri Lanka and to Thailand. I was a student at the University of Berlin, and then came to Penang, to Singapore, <coughs> and then back to Germany. But this image of Malaya never left me, so I think uh, the power of this word, Malaya, shows you know, what it can do to a young boy like myself in Germany. Well, the power of words, usually discussed in terms of semiotics, can be very, very important. I mean, there are, there are uh, words uh, like Yagudaya. Nobody knows what it really means, uh, but uh, it has something to do with Yagan and Budaya, so okay. Uh, and there are powerful words like Mandeka. Mandeka, of course, well known here, when it was shouted how many times? Three times. Mandeka, Mandeka, Mandeka. And uh, I remember when I first came to Indonesia, uh, when there was an assembly, people, especially older guys, they still concluded the meeting with Mandeka. So this term has incited movements, actions, and it was very important. And then there are, of course, Sorry, businesses. Is, is it possible for you to change places between the computer and the collector? Uh, I mean, in business, of course, they have uh, uh, understood the importance of uh, concepts and word and trying to attach meaning to it. Well, Proton is one, Volkswagen is another. And the, the, the usual thing was, it runs, it runs, it's very reliable. Now, of course, they have a struggle to put the right type of images to this label Volkswagen. So uh, the point is, there are words that have a certain meaning, the meaning changes, new meaning is attached, it changes over time, it is a stimulation for action, uh, for events that come up, and it can really uh, lead to mass movements, you know, if you have the right slogan or the right concept. Well, let's look at uh, Nusantara. Now, the linguistic uh, origin is uh, that Nusa is uh, an old Javanese term for island. It's not Sanskrit, it's old Javanese. That's, uh, that's something people get that wrong. And Antara, that is Sanskrit and has several meanings. It can mean beyond, in between, uh, or inclusive. So, uh, from my 
perspective, I will think it's something like Tanah Ayan. Hmm? So it, it, the islands and the sea that is surrounded by islands, or the islands are in the sea, but the sea and the land, the islands, belong together. Just remember that towards the end, I'll come back to this. Now, in 1305, it was mentioned on a copper plate. Uh, copper plates those days uh, were something like plates that put a building nowadays. You know, this building was opened by the chief minister of Penang, etc. So when uh, there was an event, there was a new temple, and they wrote copper plates. And on one of these copper plates, Nusantara is mentioned for the first time in a written form. I mean, it must have maybe been there before, but maybe also the scribe invented the term at that particular moment. Then, uh, the next time <coughs> it was uh, written down was in the old Javanese text, Parvatan, uh, uh, that's the early 14th century. Um, it was written down later, but uh, it was back to that time. And this is a sort of a court history of Majapahit and its predecessors. And uh, within this text, there is uh, a text that I will explain uh, in greater detail later on. This is where Gajamada, the chief minister of uh, Majapahit, he came up with an oath. And we'll look into that. Now, uh, the other uh, text is Sajarah Malayu that we all know because we all had to study that in school, right? Including myself in the university. And there it says, Kalaru Busah Kalaganya Pada Zaman Itu Segala Seluruh Jawa Semuanya Dalam Hukumnya Segala Raja Raja Nusantara Pula Setengga Taklo Kepada Baginda So it's the idea that all the Raja Raja in that area were, were sort of uh, paying allegiance to the center of power at that time, Majapahit. Now, uh, the interesting thing is that then a list of names are added, what these Raja Rajas are, and this is really a wide range, including Bahang, for instance, including the Masak Singapore, including some of the areas in Eastern Indonesia, Bali, for instance, mentioned. Uh, so uh, you get a sense of what they meant by the Nusantara. Well, then there was uh, uh, nothing much for another 100 years or 200 years, and then we get the Surat Illuminasi Raja Nusantara. This is a collection of uh, uh, memos written by the Raja Raja Nusantara to the VOC. So from that also we get an idea you know, who were considered to be rabbis of the Nusantara. And it's pretty close to what we have already seen in the Paraton text of the, uh, of the 14th century. There is another one which uh, you will see later, it has some uh, importance, Sirita Banka. Banka, as you know, is an island in Riau, and uh, <coughs> the Sirita Banka are uh, stories about a certain Bupati Nusantara, is his name, and all his adventures and so on, and uh, it's like, uh, well, uh, hero tales as you find it in the literature, and it's well known in the Riau Islands. Uh, and uh, um, how this guy, uh, this Bupati, uh, took the name Bupati Nusantara, we don't know, it's not mentioned in the text, but that was his name. And then, uh, last but not least, a recent event which uh, made it to the uh, Southeast Asian newspapers, the Laguna Copper Plate. Now, be honest, who has heard about the Laguna Copper Plate? Wow. This uh, will dis uh, disappoint all your friends in the Philippines. Because <coughs> the Laguna Copper Plates 
dated to about 900 AD by some Dutch scholars, uh, was found in uh, near Laguna City in the Philippines. Uh, I've seen pictures of it. It's it's a thin uh, copper plate with uh, a roof with um, engravings, uh, engravings uh, that look very much like uh, the various Halama inscriptions uh, in, in Sanskrit. So uh, this uh, copper plate, whether it's genuine or not, is still under uh, debate, but uh, the important thing is that in the Philippines, in those co copper plate, there are mentioned several names of places within the Philippines, but written in the same sort of script as the copper plates that you find in Java. Now why is that important? Because there is this idea of the Ala Malayu, the Malay world. And the Ala Malayu of course is Muslim because to be a Malay you have to be Muslim. Whoever thought that idea, I have no idea. Uh, and uh, if anybody knows, please tell me. But it's, it's now the conception, and it's very much emphasized to be a Malay, you have to be Muslim. Now you will have Malays in the Philippines speaking a Malay type of Australian language that are not Muslim. Big problem. Zulu is different, but now this copper plate shows that there was a close connection culturally between this island of this is Luzon and Java. And by extension, uh, Simulandro and other areas close to here. Well, uh, that in short, the uh, linguistic background of Musantara. Now back to our friend, uh, the Mahapathi of Majapahit, uh, Gajamala. By the way, he is not the vice chancellor of OPM. Uh, <laughs> But he gave the name to the university. <coughs> uh, and uh, this is a modern uh, picture of him. There are many, many such uh, uh, pictures in school books, uh, in public literature. And, uh, I, I think I could have shown you a, a, a monument, a stone engraving of him. It doesn't look very impressive, but this, of course, is, is really. The guy, and uh, to me, it also shows another aspect of the whole story: that this connection to Polynesia, because the big man is the main figure in uh, in Polynesian uh, society. A man who can talk, who is strong, who can wrestle. That's the leader. So uh, this big man phenomenon, I think, is still very prevalent in modern Malay culture. I'm not mentioning any persons. <laughs> uh, now, uh, this uh, Gajamada, uh, he uh, had uh, pronounced, this is recorded, the Zumba Mapa. Now, don't uh, ask me to read this or translate this. The ancient Japanese. Uh, but uh, the main thing is that he promises that until I have conquered all the realms of the Nusantara, I will not take any summer to my food. <laughs> now if you, if you know the Japanese, you know how keen they are. Uh, uh, by the way, there's a book, uh, book, book of the summers of the wife of Ibutin, um, uh, who was the wife of the former president. Uh, so even the high uh, ladies of Java uh, Day were very keen on preparing summer for their food. Now he says, I will not take any summer, just eat the rice. Oh dear, no. that's my something that really, 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 very, very important oath. You know? um, <coughs> And uh, in this uh, um, Zumbach, in this oath, he also mentioned 
the various areas that he wants to conquer as being part of the Nusantara. Not the part of Majapahit, of the Nusantara, he wants to conquer. And uh, we know from historical evidence that he in fact did not uh, really conquer all these areas, but many areas they sort of sent tokens of allegiance to uh, the court of Majapahit. Um, this, uh, you know, I have to repeat. He has to eat the uh, 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 some uh, very, very difficult idea. But what is more uh, interesting is here uh, I uh, put on this map some of the places mentioned in this uh, Sumpa. Uh, so the center, of course, is in Java. Uh, I mean, the ruins of the, the crater of Machapir are still visible, not, not very um, breathtaking, but uh, something like uh, uh, our fort here in Guinea. <laughs> but then uh, there is uh, some places in southern Thailand I mentioned, Damasik, that's uh, um, Singapore, Pahang is mentioned, then uh, Sri Vijaya, some places near Palembang, Dambi, uh, then Bali, and uh, there are many more places I just put down some of the most important ones. So in a way, this was sort of seen as the Nusantara in the 14th century. Uh, now there is a sort of discussion going on also among historians uh, in Indonesia. Was Nusantara the same as Majapahit? And then they come up with nice maps showing that, that you know, all these countries were really dominated by Majapahit, that sometimes they all go overboard. <coughs> and this is a nice map that I found in the text in, in, in Indonesia. Now, you see that uh, southern India and Sri Lanka was conquered by Majapahit. In fact, it's just the other way around, because there were incursions from um, this part of South India, Palawa, to Java. And in, in my studies on uh, Buddhist temples in Sri Lanka, I tried to, to show that the basic structure of some of the Buddhist temples in Sri Lanka were actually patterned on uh, the temples in Java. So it was the other way around, you know, maybe. And then, uh, of course, uh, you have Australia, part of Australia, and part of Australia. Okay, this is what is really invented history. <laughs> you will hear some more about this in a moment. Now, uh, then comes the time of uh, the anti-colonial struggle in Indonesia and Malaysia. And of course, uh, it's quite amazing you know, how uh, many rebel rousers you have in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, intellectuals and uh, politicians and you know, the, sort of the image that is projected outside the region is always, oh, they're very Sultan, or very kind, smiling. But in fact, they're full of dissidents. In fact, some of them are among us here. <laughs> now, um, I, I'm very much, uh, if, if you were students, I would say, okay, we'll now do a, a test. You know, and you identify these pictures. So if we start on the left-hand side, Oh, very easy. <laughs> and then uh, there are some others. But what um, about this guy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, um, now. Um, some uh, important persons in this anti-colonial struggle and what they had to do with uh, Nusantara. Hajar de Mandara is a nobleman from 
Dr. Gata, he in fact is known for establishing the Tamil Sisra movement, that means a school system where Javanese or Indonesian culture and art has been emphasized. So this was clearly a movement against the open larger school of the Dutch uh, higher school system, which was completely based on Dutch culture, Dutch history, etc. Uh, <coughs> now he was one who proposed, among others, the name Nusantara for a post-colonial state. And uh, then there was a discussion that was going on. Uh, another one was Daryl Stecker, Darwinese uh, 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 Dutch, uh, who is an Indo, as they call it, intellectual, who was very influential in these discussions. And uh, he first came up with the name Insolinde, which was more or less Dutch, but uh, sort of different from, from Netherlands Indies, uh, but also Nusantara was discussed. And last, not, no, sorry, to go back. So uh, this discussion was going on. Now, this um, movement, uh, the, the nationalist movement, was very much concentrated in Holland, intellectual study there, and especially in Leiden. Okay. Now, uh, the term that came up, Nusantara, Insolinde, Indonesia, were discussed very much, but the ones that had the uh, intellectual power were as Indonesian students in Leiden, Holland. Now, they, in fact, uh, were uh, studying German as their first language at that time. Uh, it was, German was the main uh, language of science, like uh, English nowadays. If you, if you speak to some of the old guys in uh, Jakarta or, or Jakarta, they all were very fluent in German, in, including uh, Sukarno. When, when I met him in the 1950s, uh, he, of course, he was talking German to me, fluently. And his German was much better than his English. <laughs> okay, now this explains a lot because these intellectuals, they read a certain text by a German ethnographer, Bastian, five volumes. Now, in those days, German scholars never wrote, say, one volume or a few pages, short papers like nowadays, five volumes on Indonesia, <coughs> the islands of the uh, archipelago. So the name Indonesia or Indonesia was used, and I'm sure all the Dutch students there had to take note of this, uh, knew the work, uh, because it was the standard work on um, Indonesia at that time. So the name Indonesia became popularized by this German scholar. But I'm trying to do uh, as well as he did by popularizing Nusantara <laughs> in brackets. Now there is uh, another story, and this is uh, connected with Pinay, which uh, I didn't put into this uh, paper because uh, I'm not really talking about Indonesia, but about Nusantara. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a guy whose statue is standing in the uh, uh, High Court, a memorial. Who knows who it is? Logan. Logan, the famous lawyer. And he is credited for having pushed the name Indonesia for Indonesia. In fact, he wrote a paper on Indonesia saying this would be the proper name. So now all the uh, scholars, the American English scholars, they say, oh, Logan is the one who proposed the name Indonesia for Indonesia, for Indonesia. Because all these scholars don't read Dutch or German, unlike the Indonesian nationalists who all had to study German, and in Lubastia, but I'm sure they never read this English paper by Logan. This is my interpretation. 
<laughs> but uh, this would be a nice thesis if you have any students you know, to, to see what really was the impact of Logan on uh, the name giving for the Republic in Indonesia. Okay, uh, now coming to Malaysia. I mean, this discussion is well, of course, also known and uh, recognized in uh, uh, this part of the world. And uh, Ibrahim Yaakov, he was one of the great leaders. Nowadays, I have a feeling uh, he's a bit sidelined. Nobody really wants to talk about him. Uh, I, I don't see any talks about him. I don't see him much in terms of publications. I don't, he doesn't turn up in the lectures. But uh, he was quite important in the struggle for Malaysian independence during the Japanese times. And he was the first who really uh, was proposing independence for Malaysia or what he said, Malayu Raya. And uh, his idea was all the Malay speaking world should, the Nusantara, should get together and form one post colonial state, which would be powerful on equal terms with China and India. So that was his vision. When the British came back, they didn't like this idea, and he was locked away, like many other rebel rousers during the nation history. Now, uh, there is also one a very interesting incident, the typing meeting, typing of all places. Uh, and uh, in, uh, this time, so Kano and Hata were coming back from uh, Vietnam. They stopped over in Taiping. There was a small airport. And they met uh, Ibrahim Jacob and Dr. Rohan Rudin. They had lunch together. I don't know whether they actually went to the secretariat or where, where they had their lunch. Uh, probably they just had some last night. Yeah. Did they have summer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they had summer. I'm pretty sure that that can be ascertained. And during this meeting, they came to an agreement that the post-colonial new state would be a state of Nusantara, including. Malay, the Malay states, uh, what, um, post Netherlands Indies, of course the Strait Settlements in Singapore, Malacca, and possibly also Philippines, but it's not quite clear whether what they decided on this, but it was clearly decided uh, that even Jacob would lead a delegation to Jakarta, they would then declare independence of this larger state. Now, Mark the date, 12th August 1945. Two to last August was 17th of August. Indonesian independence was suddenly declared by Sukarno. The Dutch were coming in, the British forces were coming in. He was afraid that uh, after uh, Japan had uh, declared surrender, that they would take over and he uh, would not have a chance to become the president of the new state. So he rushed forward, forgot about his friends in the Malay Peninsula and just declared Indonesia. But he never forgot this idea of a Nusantara or as he called it, Indonesia Raya. No, that's, Macarena was a, uh, a sort of association of independent states uh, to counter the forces uh, of imperialism, but this one was to have one great state. And this, of course, led eventually had this sort of mini-war with Singapore and uh, uh, Malaysia, and troops, uh, uh, and especially he was opposed to the integration of Sabah and Sarawak into uh, the new Malaysia. He failed, fortunately enough, uh, in this, uh, but I think this was a sort of continuation of this idea of 
uniting the Nusantara to one state. Well, who knows this uh, person? Yes, I did. Very good. I did. <laughs> oh, you're, you're not a, uh, one of these you know, former members of the PKM. Oh, you know many. You know many. Okay. Uh, now, what does IMET have to do with Nusan Ara? That's a good question. Uh, you know, some of see some of my. Uh, Professorial uh, lecture friends are here. Good question for your next exams. Huh? <laughs> if you want to get your guys to fail, that's a good question. <laughs> now, I met, uh, as we know, uh, was uh, the leader of the PKI, uh, Partai Communist Indonesia. I think he said it's Dipa Very good. Very good. Of course. Because when he was elected the chairman of the Central Committee of the PKI, uh, PKI, uh, PKI, he changed his name to Ahmad Nusantara Aide. He was not born, he was just Ahmad Aide, come from Bangka. Now he, of course, being from Bangka, he must have heard the stories about Bupati Nusantara. Yeah. So these folk tales about this famous Bupati. And of course, he also being closely associated with Sukarno and others. He knew charming his history. The Sumpa Palapa, the, uh, the Sampa Osu of Gatamada. So now I, I checked through the literature. Uh, maybe only I should go to Garakudaya and spend a few weeks there and read all your books. For free. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I couldn't find any explanation why uh, I didn't change his name. If I had known about this earlier, I'm, I, actually I did interviewed him uh, before he was killed uh, in uh, 1963. Uh, he he was, was a very sharp and very pleasant person. But I should have asked him why did you change your name to Aydek Musantara? Now I think my, my hypothesis would be that he had this idea of a joint communist state, same as China, and then the Nusantara, the communist Nusantara. And so this gave him the idea to change his name to Ahmad Nusantara I mean, he could have called him called Ahmad Karl Aydin. Okay. You know, Karl, okay, Karl Marx, but um, he was a Marxist, but he didn't. Nusantara, he took an old Japanese concept, Nusantara. So I think he must have done it deliberately, he must have thought. And he was still so much anchored sort of in local traditions and local culture that he said, this will give me the power to become the leader of the communist Nusantara state. Well, I can't prove it, it would be and hypothesis. Now we are in the present. Joko Widodo, 1961 till you know, the President of the Republic of Indonesia. When he was the governor of Jakarta, he promised to bring Nusantara culture to Jakarta. And he deliberately said, Nusantara culture should be established in uh, Jakarta and to make a point he marched into a stadium dressed up in old traditional Japanese dress together with this uh, guy Petro that should be the very famous uh, figure, very clever, very joking in the uh, either in Lutrup place or in the Vaya. So he, he used this term Nusantara culture, Budaya Nusantara. Oops. Okay, now the story goes on right to the present time. 
in uh, last year there was a, a petition brought into the uh, parliament Dukunga President Dukubidoro Setuju Morubah Nama Indonesia Menjadi Nusantara I don't have to translate this this is all the national language also used uh, in Singapore uh, now uh, I mean, nothing came of it. I don't know what happened to this, uh, but it was an official request in Parliament that Parliament should ask the President to change the name to Nusantara. So the concept is still sort of floating around, it's still a powerful concept. And then, of course, uh, at that time, he came up with this idea of the Maritime Fulcrum. Uh, that means uh, the connection to, to the established um, Indonesia as a maritime nation, emphasizing the connection throughout the Nusantara and beyond with the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. And this, of course, was in a way an answer to the Southern Silk Road uh, initiative of the Chinese government. Okay, now Nusantara is a semiotic concept. So what we do nowadays when we want to get any knowledge, we Google. Okay? <laughs> so I Googled the term uh, Nusantara uh, and to find out how many documents were found on Google that use the term Nusantara. So uh, from the 1950s onwards to uh, about 2000, very few. Once in a while it turned up not very much. And then suddenly it shot up. Now, by the way, for all the statistical risk kids among you, uh, it's not showing just the increase of the number of documents in Google, because I also standardized this by percentage of total number of uh, documents in Google and how many use Nusantara as a concept. Uh, the curve is quite similar. So there's a real increase. Now, if we see something like this, some change of uh, a, a, a measure, an indicator, this is an indicator, then we, of course, have to ask, why do we have this sudden change? Why is the suddenly this term was entirely take off around the year 2000, you know, very clearly, and then, wow, you know, becomes well known throughout the Nusantara mainly Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. Now I just uh, pick out some at random, some uh, examples. Like in uh, Indonesia, Berpati Nusantara Airlines. Okay, that makes sense. It's an airline, a regional airline that goes to the neighboring countries. But uh, if it comes to, uh, well, Nusantara surf charters, well, <laughs> Uh, or in Malaysia, Nusantara metal detector. Nusantara is a concept. So uh, the interpretation is the name has just become sort of a, a high sounding formula if you want to protect something that's good, that's interesting, appealing, you just call it Nusantara, like Nusantara Forum. Okay. <laughs> Without thinking what you're really talking about, of course. <laughs> He's a good friend, I think. <laughs> so, uh, even in uh, uh, Germany, there is uh, a Nusantara restaurant in Berlin. Quite a nice restaurant uh, where you can get uh, rice and curries and so on. It's actually Nasi Kanda there, so. <laughs> okay, now uh, most examples so far have come from Indonesia, except for the uh, early independence movement with Hitler uh, Tango, uh, Nusantara in Malaysia. <clears throat> in this Kesatwa Malay Muda that was. Uh, formed by Haji Jaco, was uh, disbanded in 1942. Uh, but uh, there is a new organization, Organizasi Sastrawan Nusantara. Um, I, I tried to 
the report of uh, Professor Mohamed Saleh to ask him uh, if I'm sure he knows something about it, but I couldn't contact him. Uh, but they uh, had several congresses. I saw uh, a well-advertised one in Singapore in 1991, and there was one in Brunei uh, two years ago, where I would have liked to go, but I wasn't in Brunei at that time. Uh, but I couldn't find any documents on it. Uh, but anyway, there is an organization that tries to get together Sastrava, I mean, poets, writers, and so on from. Uh, and they have a list of countries, and it is, of course, Brunei, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. And uh, I think there are also some delegates from southern Thailand. Nusantana Forum, Karakudaya, Hitler Institute. Of course, is the latest in this report. And uh, other organizations and events, if you look around, you find quite a few that uh, are still uh, happening. And uh, the one that is most interesting is what has now been termed Islam Nusantara. Islam Nusantara. Now, uh, this was uh, launched at the 33rd NU conference, uh, I think in, um, uh, in a small central Germanese town, I forgot the name right now. Uh, and uh, this Islam Nusantara uh, was sort of celebrated. It was a big march and big speeches were held. And the interesting thing is that NU, Ladakhul Ulama, is a really conservative Islamic movement. Not Muhammadiyya, which is sort of more forward looking, uh, or others, uh, but the conservative Ulama, maybe made up all these Kiai who run the Sajan, they are the powerful people, they proclaim Islam Nusantara. And uh, I read uh, one or two of these speeches. It's very interesting how they try to distance themselves from Arab Islam. They said, our Islam is Southeast Asian, Nusantara Islam. Our Nusantara Islam is very different from the, especially Wahhabi tradition, which of course is very powerful also in Indonesia. And what they were, uh, emphasizing is that the local culture is an important part of our Islamic practices, uh, that it is an Islam that is tolerant, that recognizes another religion, the motto of the um, Indonesian state. I mean, you unity in diversity. So we stick together, we recognize the others, but we are still Muslims, and they are firmly based on the Quran and the Hadith, but they don't want to have this Arab influences. Is it? In the same way as the Arab and their Islam, with their local cultures, we have our own, our own culture. <clears throat> and it, uh, again, would be a nice thesis for somebody to analyze the speeches that were done in a way. Uh, well, I, I just have one quote from uh, uh, Jokowi, uh, who uh, sort of just emphasizes uh, Islam yam nuk soban santon, Islam yam nuk katakrama titula, Islam nusantara, Islam yam nuk toleransi. So, so I mean, all this typical sort of Malay concepts are thrown in. And people uh, made sure that this is one Islam that should be tolerable. We had a very nice uh, talk recently in this forum by the daughter of uh, Mahathir. And uh, she mentioned also Islam in Santana. So the sisters of Islam sort of pick up this idea. It's taken hold. And there is a conference coming up, I was told, on Islam in Santana in, I think, in KL. Uh, next month. So this is, you know, the power of concept. Nusantara is now captured by modern Islamic movement. 
uh, we like this model of uh, Islamic states invented by Badawi. Was it Badawi? Yeah. Okay, there's also the dark side of it. It's not the tolerancy, the tolerant Islam, but there's also Katiba uh, Nusantara, a commando Nusantara. Uh, this was reported in the press some time ago. Uh, a Malay-speaking contingent of ISIS forces. Uh, and quite a few of them were infiltrated back into Indonesia and uh, into Malaysia. Uh, Jakarta, 14th January, two uh, weeks back, uh, a big bomb blast, and uh, Katiba Nusantara took credits for that, the terrorist act. Then uh, a number of uh, fighters of um, Malay, Malaysian and Singaporean the origins were, uh, I think, led by the Matamata Mata in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and this led uh, to uh, all sorts of reactions from the Katip Pusantaras promising to have uh, attacks on tourist sites in Malaysia. I didn't mention the event or any particular place, but uh, uh, after all these uh, problems we have seen in Paris, uh, in Brussels, uh, I'm not so sure what the world's going on, unless the uh, intelligence services are clever enough to prevent this. Okay, that's a sort of very sad and sorry story. Um, but uh, on the more lighter and more interesting uh, uh, line, uh, there uh, is a new Nusantara youth culture. And uh, just one uh, example I picked up uh, of all places from the Brunei Times. Uh, a Nusantara leadership camp, the first one was, I think, in uh, Singapore, the second was in KL. And this is uh, from uh, a post uh, on um, either Twitter, I think. Rindu Sahabat Sahabat Nusantaraku Dari Indonesia, Brunei and Thailand on Twitter. So these guys who are happy, they uh, sort of longing for their friends from the Nusantara and they mention Indonesia, Brunei and Thailand, Southern Thailand. So for them, this is the Nusantara. So the young people, they have this idea of Nusantara. And I, I was quite uh, interested in this because uh, there's always a talk about ASEAN. Now how to integrate ASEAN doesn't really work. We have big meetings and uh, all the big, big guys, they get together and have meetings, meetings, another meeting. Uh, but the young people sort of are not really uh, sort of enthused by ASEAN. But here suddenly, out of nowhere, out of the ground, you know, you can't get this movement, the use Nusantara. And uh, this uh, is also shown, uh, there's, there's like this, just one example, Gamalan Mahasiswa Sastra Nusantara from uh, UGM and there are several such groups you know, springing up. And last but least, this Nusantara pop culture. Uh, <clears throat> of course, in Rome I, I uh, talk uh, quite often to my uh, uh, fellow staff members there when I was uh, in uh, University of Brunei Dar es Salaam and uh, they were talking about this uh, pop music, Manatnga. Uh, Banana Nusantara. Uh, I think the younger ones of you will all know that. The older ones, I'm not so sure whether you still listen to pop. No? Uh, and uh, I, I should have actually played this uh, song uh, uh, here. Because um, it's downloaded, you can download it from the internet. 
There is a song uh, of this Balada Nusantara on Chitta Nusantara. And then the refrain always comes up with the same words that I uh, put down here. Lau Membiro Mokan Pemisach, Sloka Pantum Kazana Kita, Itona Kita Inusantara. Kita Inusantara. We in the Nusantara. Uh, it's, it's a very, very nice song, and uh, <coughs> when you uh, sort of ask students uh, somewhere, they will know it, they will listen to it. Uh, it's uh, quite, uh, this is uh, one uh, Ajay Kassan and others sing this song quite well known in the pop culture. Okay, now I'm getting to the end, but I want to uh, enjoy uh, Another story with you uh, that you find on the internet. There are uh, internet pages that pop up. Uh, I copied some of them. When I want to go back, they vanish. And this is uh, a story about the Nusantara Empire, the Kaiseran Nusantara, or the Kaiseran Sunda Nusantara. Uh, just one example, capital city is called Jayakarta. <laughs> the largest city in the empire is Berlin. The official language is Nuswantara, whatever that may mean. Now they formed a coalition with Otto von Bismarck, who was the king of Bavaria. Uh, the Kaiser Lungana, the ruler of the empire in the 1920s, he had a meeting with the Bupati Amsterdam, Morris von Groningen, and they actually posted a photo of the two. So this obviously is Morris von Groningen, and this is the emperor of Nusantara. I consulted all my friends, I know, you know anthropologists, historians, and so on. What do you make of this? Is that maybe a Kabatina movement that is behind? Is it just some punks who have a vivid imagination and come up with these signs? But then I found a story in the Kopas that two officials of the Empire of Nusantara were arrested by police in Maniwani. So even the police apparently believes in these stories, so they can arrest people for creating, uh, uh, there was some, uh, what was the term they used, something uh, like uh, working against the state. Sedition. Sedition, something, sedition. Wow, you know, I said, well, I mean, there must be something, but I could not find any greater details of this. Well, again, very nice uh, topic, uh, who wants to pick it up? Uh, you know, I see some of the younger guys. Very interesting topic for an interesting uh, master thesis or surfing through the internet, collecting this and then going to Indonesia or I don't know whether maybe in Brunei or in Malaysia somewhere, a website is created with all these very, very nice stories. I had like, collected quite a few of them, fantastic. Uh, and another one also I found there was the uh, foreign minister was Angela Merkel and uh, uh, the uh, Bupati was called Schweinsteiger. <laughs> the striker from Bayern München. So I mean these are people that have a vivid imagination. They sort of mixed up history and present times. Uh, and uh, it's sort of, it's quite weird, you know, but interesting. Nusantara, Nusantara. Okay, now I come to my last point, Nusantara and the South China Sea. Now you all know that the South China Sea is the big uh, area of potential conflict and trouble. The Americans, our worlds, never call it South China Sea, they call it an extension of the Pacific Ocean. Ocean is of course claimed by the American Navy, so by using this term, 
they also claim that they should really also cover the extension of the, of the Pacific Ocean, the South China Sea. And that's why they drive their planes and their warships right up to the border of uh, Hainan or of uh, Shenzhen or China anyway. Now, this is the, uh, the area, and uh, I mean, this is just a map showing the number of ships and traffic that goes through the area with a lot of uh, that there are sort of um, one third of all world uh, traffic goes through the South China Sea. So the Chinese have an idea, they call it, we want to revive the Southern Silk Road. The Indonesians have their uh, maritime fight room, whatever that may be. And the Malaysian government has nothing. I checked with some of my former students in the Prime Minister's office. He said, oh yeah, we have a Malaysian maritime policy paper, but this has not been put to the cabinet, has not been discussed or decided. I don't know what's in it. That's <laughs> So uh, the question is, now what uh, do countries like uh, Malaysia do with the claims to the South China Sea. The only ones that are really vocal are the Filipinos. They are always vocal about anything, especially the women. <laughs> and uh, the Vietnamese also had some clashes about this. And now, nowadays there are so many other things happening in the world, but if you read sort of page four or five of the newspapers, there's always something, some incident. Fishermen are being nabbed. Uh, some, uh, Jets pass over a warship, uh, some meeting takes place. I mean, it's a very volatile area. So what, what to do with it? The um, power of words, I think. Uh, what one could use to mediate these various claims to parts of the South China Sea. You, know, you see, all the countries have a certain claims overlapping. Would be to come some sort of, some sort of understanding. And why not try this old concept of Nusantara, land and sea, a Southeast Asian concept that has survived through hundreds, thousands of years of history, is known by the population, at least in, uh, in definitely in Indonesia, but I think also in Europe. Or to some people, I, I ask some students, oh yeah, I'm sorry, oh, they know the concept, not exactly what it means, but they know it. And so uh, one could perhaps think about a blueprint, like the Book of, book of Royal Joint Development Areas. But there are some attempts in this direction, say, okay, uh, like Brunei and Malaysia came to some agreement, we do some joint exploration of a certain area for oil or oil or other gas and so on. Or one could think of, say, maritime strata titles. Uh, I, I own the condo, I have a title to it, 23rd floor, that's not mine. Uh, the one below, the one above, are different people. Now also in the maritime areas, you could have one has a title of free shipping, the other one has for fishing, and the other one, the bottom, for oil exploration. So you could have strata titles for areas. Sharing, going together, if you go to a Malay platform, somebody is owning the tree, and the other guy is doing the Sama people. So I mean, this idea of sharing the same area is quite common, it's quite acceptable. Maybe not to the Chinese, I'm not so sure, but at least from a sort of Malaysian, Indonesian perspective, this may be something uh, to revive the sort of land, sea, tanah, air vision of the South China Sea. At least we'll think about this under this label of Nusantara. Thank you for your attention. My daughter thanks you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, and see you back. We started off 700 years ago analyzing copper plate inscriptions, but then he moves on finally to Google Analytics, Twitter feeds, and so on. The, I said a protein by and uh, so on. Is this going to be a Lusantara empire? I don't think Angela Merkel or Bastian Schweinsteiger, by the way, Bastian Schweinsteiger is the footballer, formerly of Bayern Munich and now of Manchester United. And he was meant to be, what, the finance minister, was it? Or sports minister or something? I think we should have uh, Edra Hans Dieter Effers the first of Lusantara. <laughs> and of course, no doubt, he would appoint to his information ministry the one and only. Mustafa Kemal, of course, please. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, good evening. Um, it seems to me that the uh, discussion was held and yeah, uh, relates very much to the question of uh, representations. Um, what I mean here is that uh, Representations where we give meanings to ideas, symbols, uh, concepts, uh, cultural artifacts, yeah. or for that matter, songs. And at times, as we have uh, seen in the presentation, uh, the meanings are contested and can become a source of uh, cultural or political conflicts. Of disputes. Now, again, as was shown earlier on, these representations or meanings may change over time and place, and uh, even within a particular community or nation. To my mind, sometimes a symbol or a concept, as in the case of Nusantara. Uh, that school will be summoned at a time when a community is perceived to be facing adversity, from the, especially from the outside. Representation also involves the trajectories of inclusion and exclusion, as we have seen earlier, that in turn gives rise to conflicts and contestation. That explains perhaps why, you know, Sankara at one point in time consists of A, B, C, and D, and another time you minus two or three or one uh, uh, states. To give an example of a uh, uh, local example, a recent example, yeah, of what I meant by representation, Jalo Gamila, the national flag, which is actually a piece of cloth that has on it red and white stripes, a crescent and a 14-point star. A normal cloth with all its designs, and yet it stands for Malaysia. And it's supposed to evoke a sense of pride among people who call themselves Malaysian. And this sense of collective identity you like an imagined community to borrow Ben Anderson, is also made possible by print capitalism. We're talking about media, because through media you could actually uh, magnify this idea of working uh, of together. Um, I suppose, coming back to Nusantara, my sense of it is that perhaps in the modern day, uh, situation, it may not get that traction among people uh, because the media that has you know, haven't been uh, popularizing this idea of Nusanta. Um, <coughs> to, to take another example um, of representation, yeah. the <coughs> The color green stands for some people for the environment, for the environment, or at least a reminder of environmental destruction. For the others, 
it connotes Islam or being Muslim. Yeah? And to take another example, to be a Buddhist at one time perhaps gives you that pride of being a warrior. But now I'm not sure to be a Buddhist, especially after some financial uh, scandal. Yeah? Uh, we, we, we connote different things. Um, the presentation also suggests that the, as again, just to, uh, to give an emphasis on what I said earlier on, uh, showed that Nusantara as a concept is to some extent is fluid. Yeah? Um, so it changes from place to place or from time to time. Um, <coughs> Um, and that's why we, we get that uh, instance of uh, the, in your section, the battle of words, yeah, where you say there's this organization, Sastrawan Musantara, comprising writers, novelists, poets, and politicians and from Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, and Indonesia, forming this this particular organization called Organisasi Sastrawan Nusantara. And then you also mentioned about Ibrahim Yaakob meeting Sukarno Hatta in Taiping, who had this similar idea of having Nusantara. And yet, in another occasion, uh, you had this notion of Nusantara being, uh, uh, being dashed or this ambition to have this with the uh, endeavor to form, or at least to integrate Sawa and Sawa into Malaysia. Yeah. Um, now you also talk about the the emergence of, or you wonder why this sudden uh, interest in the use of Nusantara. Uh, in the, well, the present day, we talk about these various companies using this other. I'm, I'm myself not sure too, but my guess would be, or at least uh, one possible reason could be that uh, in the case of certain companies, perhaps the word Nusantara would be both. Uh, uh, an idea of of the old, or going back to Majapai, you know, the kind of the glory. Also, perhaps a uh, uh, an indication of something that has been established for some time, uh, and hence you are in good hands in terms of your experience, your your management of business. And what I do. Um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, you, you gave the example of ID uh, changing his name to Ahmad Musantara ID, right? I, I suppose. He could do that uh, primarily because he's somebody, he's someone of a high profile, being the chairman of the Communist Party, yeah. okay. uh, as opposed to someone else who is not, who is just a man in the street and, uh, and therefore do not have this, that significance of coming from this change of name, uh, uh, Nusantara. Um, The example that you give on Islam and Santara is interesting in the sense that, uh, uh, as you said, it is a response to this uh, radical Islam and also the 
in the church of Isis in the Middle East. And therefore, it, this uh, denotes the attempt to push for a moderate Islam. Uh, not just the attempt to push for a moderate Islam, but also the kind of Islam, as also mentioned, compatible with the cultural environment uh, that we have in Indonesia, which is not advised. And more, more importantly, the kind of Islam that is not Wahhabi or Salafi, which is quite radical. Yeah? Uh, and the use of Nusantara, perhaps, is to uh, give the idea that uh, um, this effort should be uh, welcomed by not just the Indonesia perhaps, but also the outer uh, area of Indonesia uh, to give uh, the significance of this uh, endeavor to, 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 uh, to, to counter the influence of uh, Wahhabi Islam in Indonesia primarily. Um, another thing that I want to uh, say here is that uh, the notion of Nusantara from time to time also gets subverted uh, by cultural dispute yeah, that uh, we have actually Malaysia between Malaysia and Indonesia in recent times over the case of Batik, we were quarreling over whose Batik is yeah, it's our Batik or is it your Batik? Yeah, and, and Rasa Sayang. Yeah, and many other things. So, the, this little dispute somehow you know, is, uh, shapes that, that notion of that, that, that uh, harmonious notion of, of being together in a greater Nusantara or greater uh, Alam Rayu. Um, And uh, yeah, finally, I would like to say that uh, it's always, for me, it's always good to investigate the origins of a particular concept, and in this case, Nusantara, uh, idea or symbol, because uh, it not only unpacks many assumptions, it also tells us about our collective identity or identities. Uh, and uh, equally important, it tells us also who has the power or cloud to ensure that uh, this, uh, their own cultural representation gets traction among the ordinary people. Thank you. Let's hope it leads to a revelation, because everyone knows this as the Nusantara Forum, but where did the name come from? When we were discussing and negotiating, uh, setting up the forum, in fact it was left to Zairo, uh, Zairo Kiyajahari, who's the head of the Penang Institute, and it was he who actually proposed the title Nusantara Forum, because this reflected one of the four pillars of research inside the Penang Institute. So I have a question now back to you. How come one of your four pillars was not called ASEAN studies, or was not called you know, Southeast Asian regionalism, and so on and so on? So I'd like to know why you, presumably you are one of the architects of the research pillar, why you yourselves call the research pillar some time. So that will be a question uh, over to you later. But let me open to the floor. I'm sure there's lots and lots of questions, particularly from Hans's very far ranging presentation. Very short, 700 years. Anyone? Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Hans. So, uh, 
Well, first, I'll just respond to a point made by you or a question where you asked uh, who actually started it being Malayu. Uh, you have to be a Muslim, right? So, uh, Leonard Andaya in Leaves of the Same Tree, uh, published a few years ago, he claimed uh, that Aceh being Malacca's successor as the center of the but he, didn't, he did not call it a Nusantara world, he called it a Malayu world, spelled with an O, Malayu. Uh, so when Aceh replaced Malacca in the 16th come 17th century, uh, Aceh was the one that cemented Islamic identity and essence uh, into the word Malayu. And when Johor succeeded Aceh as the new center, Johor Riau, Aceh did not hold on to Malayu as its primary identity, and I guess as a, as a matter of pride, decided to focus more on it being Archimedes rather than being Malay. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's the response, I guess. A uh, question would be so we talk about the concept of Nusantara and how it encompasses the, the region. Uh, I'm, from that book also, there's a mentioning of a 14th century Japanese poet. I think it's called Desa Warnana, if I'm not wrong. And that poem split the region into the Bumi Malayu and Bumi Java. So I just want to ask in your opinion then how does the word or the concept Nusantara will it, will it be in contradiction to that poem? Uh, yeah. That's all. I gather uh, two three questions if there are some more, please. Okay. I mean, this, uh, these are some uh, very uh, deep uh, and uh, important questions uh, that you come up with. And I'm sure there are many others. Uh, now, um, uh, if you refer to Andaya's various uh, writings, I mean, he, he also wrote a paper on the Sea of Malayu, uh, which was uh, formerly the area where the south, the, well, the southern part of the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca, uh, <coughs> and was known as such. Uh, uh, so he uh, also pointed out this importance of Malayu versus then suddenly the spit out in Aceh and so on. And so you, you, you have this, uh, I think you also, you know, we're heading in this direction, you have sometimes these contradictions coming up, uh, uh, that uh, the area sort of splits into different uh, identities uh, or collective representations, and then it gets together again. You know, it's, it's a flow of, of history. Um, but um, the, the main uh, sort of um, conceptual difference I, I see is between the Alam Malayu and Indonesia Naya. Uh, Indonesia is seeing itself as the main power, which in fact it is, in terms of population and the economy and uh, even the military. Um, and uh, uh, they sort of see themselves in a similar position like uh, maybe China, you know, which is the this Tungbo, is this Central power, and then the others are sort of have certain relations to, to that, uh, either uh, in terms of trade and so on, or cultural exchange. But the dominant power is always in Beijing. In the same way, Jakarta is the sort of center, and the others, the Indonesia Raya. But then, of course, that doesn't uh, you know really go down well uh, in um, uh, the rest of the Malay world, you know, where there's a different concept. Um, and in Indonesia, it's also hotly debated, you know, uh, is Bahasa Indonesia a Malay language? Yes. <laughs> it, uh, it's an Austronesian, it's a Malay language, it, it has a few Dutch words in it. Uh, but uh, the Indonesians don't popularly see it that way. You know? So they want to establish this is 
the, the national language, and then you have Bahasa de Era, and I always Bahasa de Era. So the, I mean, you have these uh, split, splits, uh, and when, when you talk about Musantara, you get an even wider range. Because, uh, uh, as I, I explained in the Philippines, uh, there is this debate going on, are we Malayo or are we not? In fact, I mean, uh, in terms of history, in terms of uh, culture and language, well, it's the Austronesian language, Tagalog or Visayan, and it's, they are part of the Dunia Malayu. Uh, and uh, the, one of the first uh, national, national, national hero, the main national hero, was Rizal, who, who you know, was going for independence from uh, the Spaniards before. Uh, all the independent fighters in Indonesia or Malaysia came up. Uh, so what, what you have is sort of a flow of history, expansion and contraction, and, uh, split. Uh, and um, that's it, interesting in itself, you know, from as a scientific enterprise. But what, what I thought uh, is interesting is to use it as a political weapon. To have a concept uh, that covers the area, which is more powerful than the uh, the Arian uh, secretariat in their meetings, you know, or a nicely dressed in public, or whatever they <laughs> address. You know, there is a sort of a lot of among that, that produced by politicians. But the popular feeling is a different one. And, and what I see is this new stream of popular. Nusantara identity, which is not necessarily an ASEAN identity. Um, so this is in the making, and it's a continuation of its long history of construction <coughs> and extension. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting um, talk. Uh, what I wondered was when, when you showed this Google graph and showed how it went up in the 90s and you were talking about how this term maybe is on vogue now even for companies. And, uh, where do you think um, this comes from? So what triggers this boom in the 90s? And well, this is exactly <laughs> the question I was posing. I don't have an answer. But I guess I uh, Well, um, I mean, it, it's, I have a, a weak hypothesis. Uh, is that uh, uh, at that time, I think, that, I mean, you were heading in this direction. There, there's a big challenge to local cultures from the globalization process. Uh, I mean, uh, McDonald's comes in, American comes on. Uh, the locals of cultural traditions go down, you know, the Canadian heritage just it puts up a big fight to you know, keep things going. Uh, and uh, there are all sorts of cultural movements. So uh, in, in that time, uh, maybe um, suddenly some of the old concepts come up. You know, I, I wrote another paper, it was called The, the Sanskritization of Jakarta. <laughs> I started uh, and uh, I just uh, um, I was working on, on urban sociology. So this was a side effect that I suddenly saw that new buildings were coming up, and uh, the new buildings all had sort of old Japanese or Sanskrit names, Vinagrana or something like that. You know? So uh, in, in, in contrast, for instance, to Singapore, where there's Harbour City or uh, World Trade Center. Or, this is also in, sorry, the Singaporeans here, but the, I mean this is sort of engrandisement. You know, Singapore is a big city. It's a small city. It's a small city. Penang is Times Square. Penang is Times Square. Well, also Penang. is always big. Well, it's always following following uh, Singapore in a way. So that, that's one. I mean, one emphasis. The point is one is emphasizing global global connection, globalization. And then in Takata, suddenly is a counter movement in terms of name giving. You know, names and concepts are important. They suddenly come up with old Japanese names. Uh, and, um, well, 
that this is maybe a cloud offset for this, that uh, uh, at a certain moment, as a counter moment to globalization, sort of local concepts are being picked up. And they're not only picked up in terms of historical research, I mean, there are few historians you know that do that, but it comes up that suddenly as a popular, you know, that it's, it's nice to go or uh, all your company, uh, world's best company, or something, but you, you call it Nusantara, which means the same as it's an engrandisement of a, a company selling metal detectors. You know? <laughs> so, uh, and I know this is a hypothesis, but uh, I, um, I came to this whole topic partly also by being questioned by students all the time. And so, what should I write my master's thesis on? Think about interesting topics and don't just take some odd paper from some American who uh, put into a replication of some scale or something. But look at the local uh, issues that come up and then write something on that. And that's, so then, then, I, then they say, oh, yes, that's nice, but what is your suggestion? And I say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then you think about it, and so I came up with this sort of topic, uh, mainly as a stimulation. Uh, and, and as a young scholar, I would never allow somebody I supervise to write a paper that goes from, uh, say, uh, 1403 to uh, 2016. <laughs> <laughs> it's likely to fail. <laughs> but I, Yeah, okay, it's basically 
they are Roman Catholics. I will give you the word of the and what is that? I met Roman Catholics in their mind, they are Greeks. But you don't speak Roman, they have their own English. And they are Catholics. So, there is a different understanding of what constitutes Roman. And that is why the, the, the term Lusantara can only be applied in the way of It might work in literature, poetry, but when you try to give it a critical or an ethical approach, it's going to fall flat. People don't have a solid ground. Because there are too much diversity to give it substance. As something that is very broad, it can be acceptable. So when you mention the mental intelligence, nobody's going to be offended by it. I'm going to come to your question in a minute, but I, I, actually, could I just follow up on uh, a point uh, that Arafin made? Because essentially, the modern of Santara concept that you're, you're saying is emerging as a sociological fact, but in a, even in the normative sense, you're suggesting maybe uh, a, a means of resolving regional disputes in South China Sea as well. It's essentially a transnational project. I think there are regional projects, but they're very much anchored to nation states. So Mahathir, in the late 80s and early 1990s, had something, and uh, it's Tim Bunnell's phrase, not that, but it's a great phrase. Mahathir had this view. The Indians, they've got a diaspora. The Chinese have got a diaspora. Now the Jews have got a diaspora. So the Malays need to find and create a diaspora. So Mahathir suffered from diaspora envy. <laughs> Freudians will know what I'm talking about uh, in a different kind of envy. Um, and a whole lot of money, a whole lot of uh, uh, institutionalization, uh, a lot of research was put forward to actually create, to invent a notion of Dunia Malayu, Alam Malayu, and so on. And so that's why they went off to Sri Lanka, they went off to Madagascar, they went off to the Cape, and so on and so on. Let's find this diaspora and bring it home. But the difference between that and the Rural Santara transnational project, it's deeply anchored by, legitimized by the nation state, the hard shell of the nation state. And I'm wondering if some of this Indonesian notions of using the Santara are equally anchored to the notion of the nation state. So it's not about transcending nation states uh, in any way or form. Um, and secondly, when you're looking at youth culture or NU or these other social movements that seem to be laying some claim to the Santara, um, do you see that because the uh, regional project uh, of the elites, ASEAN, which has been around after all for a long time, since 1967, is still fundamentally an intergovernmental, in other words, a state-to-state -state project, it's very much an elite project. It has very little purchase. Uh, unlike the European project, for all its deficiencies and all its problems, has created, I think, a youth that sees itself increasingly as European as much as any other identity. I don't think any, there's no social movement in Southeast Asia that sees itself primarily as Nusantara or Southeast Asia. I think it's still very much not international or perhaps subnational. I think these are things that I don't think yet the uh, Santara wave can yet wash away completely. That's my pickup up on uh, what you were talking about. Get off your phone, man. <laughs> 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 young, young people today, what's all their phone? Okay. <laughs> now, uh, I mean, coming back to my uh, younger days, this was a long way off. Um, when I, to sing the Socialist International. <laughs> I think I can still sing it, of course. <laughs> uh, and I was very much taken by the European idea, which uh, you know, at that time in Europe was formed, was really was something to fight for and so on. So uh, I, from that time, uh, national uh, or nationalist skeptic. Uh, and I think that uh, our friends from political science have grossly overrated the nation state, uh, including some of the famous uh, writers on that, you know, which also turned up here and there in, in the discussion. Uh, imagine the community and all that. Um, the nation state is there, the nation 
cities of Poland, it's one of the units, that you also have local uh, authorities, you have sort of local uh, identities that are very strong and so on. In the same way you have, that's, that's sort of in the making, I think, sort of identities that are far larger and are not tied to political entities. I mean, that's, that's a sort of, uh, well, if you want to call it a hypothesis of something that is in the making, I try to capture that. Uh, and um, <clears throat> that's, that's why I was uh, sort of talking about some of these uh, uh, not very important events, like, like a leadership in Lusantara, that people say, oh, we are Lusantara, who we are. I think these are some indicators that something is sort of coming up. And the question is then, on what side do we stay? Do we uh, effect the nation state? Or do we think, well, oh, shouldn't we set time to think beyond the nation states? And on some other issues. Okay, <clears throat> now which way is going to go? We'll see. But I, I firmly believe that there is something growing. And you still have to have little, little uh, tokens of this. And, and this is interesting uh, to research, to look into this intellectual. Now, the question of the uh, Taiwanese imperialism. That's, uh, of course, an issue that's also debated and has been a big issue in Indonesia itself. I mean, from the PLRE uh, times uh, when the sort of where separatist movements came up, that we are dominated by Javanese. You know, they sent tons of grass, they sent the people everywhere. We are sidelines. So there was this conflict between, not only politically, but also culturally, we do not want to be um, sort of dominated by Javanese Begawai. Um, and I am a joke. A cruel joke. Nusantara Forum is a cool joke. That's what we anticipate. Just remember that. You're being recorded. I know. I know. The people that are people that don't speak Malay, so. I remember attending a Lutro performance of all places in Padang, in Sumatra. And there was this. Guy, a speaker, a person who was always sort of talking to somebody about uh, uh, me, uh, sort of uh, poking fun at uh, functions of officials. So he said, Kagawa, Kagawa, Papa, Papa, Yang Tahoma, Papa, Papa, Tahoma, Papa, Papa, Besar, Papa, Papa, Besar. Oh. <laughs> So uh, everybody riot, you know, everyone was screaming. You know? So I mean, this was this uh, sort of the, the weapons of the week. Yes. You know, so um, and also expressing this anti because all the big governments were all of Taiwanese, you know, in the, even in the local uh, administration. Uh, the mayor of Padang, for whom I worked at the time, he was uh, a navy officer. So. So anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, just a, a joke about this. But, um, uh, so I, I see that there, there are these uh, feelings of uh, contestation between uh, sort of Javanese imperialism, cultural imperialism, domination, and the Javanese. Uh, they are, up to a certain extent, they are really some moment because they think they are very harmless and, and, and they emphasize this and so on. Sometimes in a very positive way, in terms of arts and culture, where they're really great, but also sometimes the others are somewhat low. Um, so uh, we, we all see that, but uh, in terms of sort of national education, which is done in Barca and Malaysia, uh, there's a sort of, uh, sort of ethnic differences are ironed out. So it is going down. Was much much stronger. In the 1950s, I mean, they had a war going on. You know, and these movements within Indonesia, no more, no question, even that she is. So we have to see this. These are 
are long-term trends that might change. And we never know exactly, are they going back to the, the old regionalism, or are they going towards uh, Indonesia, or even towards sort of Nusantara. And uh, the main thing is that there is such a concept which uh, is an inter-regional concept for this area, which has a sort of maybe a Majapahit background. That's why there's this discussion. Was the Nusantara Majapahit or is it something different? It's, it's being discussed also by in the region intellectuals. Uh, so if there is such a concept, why not use it? They use it for conflict mediation and so on, uh, rather than uh, sort of in this bureaucratic terms the way uh, ASEAN is. Sure, I will take you there first. Nusantara was the one which really attracted me to come to this evening's talk. I just want to know what made people bring back to use the word Nusantara. What made them do that? And what is the connotation, the implication of using the word Nusantara? Is there a geopolitical undertone to it? With the possibility of a final <coughs> political solution for the, for the country's industrialization? Oh, Majapahit, so called empire. To me, Nusantara is a very neutral word. I mean, politically. To me, the same time is a very nice word, very easy to hear. That's why it's a new term. Is there a political undertone to this? Is there an objective, finally, towards the end? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can I go ahead? Yeah, I think it will be. I think it will be soon enough. Um, well, okay, things that you said. Um, sorry, I didn't get to know your name. Um, why? Okay, I think it was Suhanko, uh, Suhanko that says, um, people in Indonesia ask me why we use Malay as the base of Indonesian language, or rather Bahasa Indonesia, uh, with, of course, chunks of Javanese and other languages. Um, because it, it, he simply said that we can't ignore it because everybody seems to be speaking Malay language all over the island. So if we talk about islands, some of the um, uh, words, uh, I mean, Nusa is actually also island. Nusa, also some uh, small daerah, Bahasa daerah also uh, means islands. And Antara, these or in between, so rather Nusa is also nation. Rather these nations that we have around us and becoming one Indonesia or Melayu Raya or rather, you know, and then that's one this new movie about uh, Joko, Amin, Joko Aminoto talking about uh, whether they can decide Malaysia, Malay, Malay Raya, Malaysia Raya, whatever, Indonesia Raya, whatever. So I think it will be because if you look at pop culture now, people are commenting about a uh, YouTube song, Siti Nuhaliza, and then they, they'll be beakers about they say that musicians from Indonesia is great, better than Malaysia. Then you have people come and say, hey, we are one in Santara, why are we bickering? And then when you talk about Islamic Nusantara uh, Islam Nusantara by the ulama, and then you also have people in Malaysia talking about on social media talking about why we, this, we don't like what happened, why Wahabi, it's not good for us because the Malaysia has always has uh, you know that diffuse of Sufism in uh, the way of you know Islam that they're having. So you really have that, and then that's the scenario that we, we are this only Wahabi or Arabization if you must. And we're saying that we have our own machine that has been practiced and has been very successful. Uh, so far, I mean, it, we are quite peaceful, right? So, and then a uh, nation state, uh, Majapahit colonized this uh, part of 
uh, Sumatra and then spread Jaya colonized part of Jawa interchangeably over the thousands or hundreds of years perhaps and then they marry one another from one dynasty to another so that peace, they can keep peace yeah, and then they be at war with one another and Sumitaya have nation state first part perhaps in Goja and Sea of Malayu is as far as spread the island where it is now it is actually Sea of Malayu, the hearts of Sea of Malayu you know, so yeah, why not? It's not a Japanese concept really, it's actually a Malay concept Nusantara, this nation state it has not been it is not weird, it's not foreign to us to the Malays around here and then of course there's what did he say about Mafi Lindo, whether the Malaya I think one Hawaiian Kini uh, Mexican of Ubaka and one guy from the Philippines they wanted to have this concept Malayo Raya you know, and then we have a problem because Malaysia decided to have this definition in the constitution that says Malay has to be Muslim and then they decided Okay, in Indonesia we have a lot of Christians, Malay Christians, and Philippines as well. They got stuck there, as well as why. And then the Australian concept also is quite new. Initially they used Malayo Polynesia, and then when they call it Bahasa Malayo, then they, they, then they started to use Australian because some people are not uh, comfortable with having that Malayo concept because Malayo then is Islam in Malaysia. It has been embedded in the constitution itself, the legal document, so it's very, yeah, so. It's quite complex. It's a great stream of consciousness. Yeah. Any more? Take one more. It's not really a question, but I guess this is a forward and I add on to what you were saying. Um, if we want to define um, in English, all of us living in this region we call Southeast Asia. And in a way, we could also be identified as inside Tara. Because to me, it's a neutral word meaning the Malay world. Definition meaning the islands of Indonesia, Malaysia up to the south of Thailand, and maybe some parts of the Philippines. So I've been reading a work by Dr. Farish Noor. Yeah. So he's an associate professor of uh, history at Raja Ratnam's School of International Studies. And he's postulating that we perceive the idea of the nation state because of sort of Western concepts of the modern nation state and we were thinking about the idea he was saying about the idea that in the past this region the idea of borders and countries did not exist things were functioning along the idea of the kingdom or a polit polity and another thing I want to draw on was the idea that in the past from the kingdoms of the south of India all the way to this region were part of this larger fluidly flowing intercultural exchange which uh, was with the start of colonial colonization start to change that and then we start to perceive ourselves as separate identities and i want to draw his attention to the idea of the uh, you, you were saying about is party indonesian or malaysian i mean i would say these are the signs that we are actually part of a, a, a cultural linguistic world that if our minds are continually thinking in terms of a western idea of borders and, and straight lines, the idea of race, culture and everything is actually relatively fluid. Uh, question. Do you think the Nusantara concept has any purchase whatsoever beyond self-defining Malay communities. So what about China in the, the Malaysian context? You think among the youth, Chinese youth, ethnically Chinese youth, ethnically Indian youth, they have that sense of uh, purchase of a regional identity? Or do you think it's confined mainly to Malay Muslim youth? Uh, who knows? I mean, you have to ask them. Uh, uh, I think this is all very much in flux. I mean, this is uh, came also uh, you know, in, in the various discussions here. But uh, what uh, I think uh, is uh, is interesting is uh, that the, the, it's very nice. I mean, it's a very nice only word. Okay, it sounds much much better than ASEAN or, or something. Yes, Nusantara. <laughs> Uh, so it, uh, there's, there's a cultural con content with which you can identify. Uh, uh, you know, while I was working with this, I, I also had to identify with it. I, 
I'm a gentleman uh, 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 Naka, if you want to call it that. So uh, I, I like this, this term. You know, uh, I'm not a Jew, uh, I'm not a Malay, I'm not a Muslim, but still it's appealing to me. So, so and that's, I think, this, uh, appealing to many, especially young people, in, as you said. It's, uh, it's a general term which can be used by many. Um, but then, um, also looking back again, um, I remember doing research on, on small scale trade uh, in uh, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and in the South China Sea, and I was traveling on these ships. And I remember uh, there was a sea captain, he was uh, probably a Bougainese, as he was coming from. And Finland and uh, going uh, to Malaysia. And I asked him so what, what he's doing. He said, Oh, my son is going to be married in Chengalu, so I'm going to visit that new family. Uh, and I thought, It's a long way to go. Uh, can you go in one day? Oh, no, I, I stopped over uh, at the, the Raja Singapura. I said, Excuse me, Raja Singapura, who's that? He said, Oh, big one, you. Now, <laughs> about <laughs> this, sorry, I think a good is that, I mean, for, for this uh, sea captain who was traveling around, he was a very educated person, he was a very good navigator. I was in the Merchant League before, so I can touch on this. He, he, uh, for him, uh, there were all these different rajas still around, whether they were Chinese or Arab, or it didn't, it didn't uh, matter. They were all part of this. Uh, probably Nusantara. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's one thing. <coughs> the, the other thing is that uh, I, um, it's a youth movement. I mean, that's a new thing, and, and they do not think in, very much in nation state politically. They're not, more, I mean, most uh, of the students I, I mean, in Malaysia or somewhere, they are not, not very nationalistic. Not like the father's generation in Indonesia, no, not the car, not the car, not the still chanting. They are, they are interested in sort of cultural relations, in pop songs and being on Twitter and so on, uh, which uh, is not a negative thing. I mean, they, they have a much wider sort of framework of what they like and what they dislike. And it goes beyond the nation state. So that's why I think Nusantara is a very interesting concept for them. And, my prediction would be that it will be picked up. Yeah, most of us here are old guys, you know. So, how is the prediction? No. Not all of us. I didn't say all of us. <laughs> most of us. <laughs> so, that's, that's a generational shift it's, uh, that I seem to analyze as a sociologist. Mine is not an intellectual or political response, it's just a very uh, lay person personal response. I observe that uh, Malay culture has evolved and the Malay culture we see now is very different from the ones we experienced in our childhood, if we are of the same vintage. So when I evoke this romanticized idea of Musantara, I'm longing for the whole world charm. The Malays that grew up with me side by side and we used to jog it together and no no inhibitions and we just absorbed it, you know. So that's that's when I fall for the word Misaka. And it's something that I'm missing now. Well and uh, there are lots of young people who also you know, feel that way in one respect. Uh, I mean, there's a sort of, uh, it, it's in a way, it's also, a, I think, a revivalism. You know, that some of the old things uh, are coming back and I see, oh, that's, no, that's nice. You know, we, we have been sort of westernized, Americanized for a long But look at our old cultures, they're very, very diverse, but there's a lot of, it's a Nigali. So, anyway. Uh, I would hope it will go in this direction. But maybe it will be wishful thinking. Uh, who knows what is going to happen? Some conflict coming up. And like in Europe now, and everything was 
we're going to school today, not everything is picked up to set. Who knows what's going to, to happen to, to this part of the world. And if some uh, big shots start to fire at each other in the South China Sea, it's pretty close and the whole thing can go up. Who knows? You know, but, uh, well, uh, uh, die Hoffnung stirbt am letzten Wurzel in Englisch. Um, hope dies last. Hope dies last. Hope dies last. Hope dies last. There you go. Hope dies last. Mr. Hans, this is a fascinating uh, uh, reflection. And uh, the other bit, since you've been commenting a lot on age in this room, in a very dangerous way, what I find fascinating about Hans, do you remember he said he first came in 1959, so he has a certain stature and so on. But he's always inquisitive about the new yeah, and finding new methodologies and so on. And this is what's really, really refreshing. I won't even tell you how old he is because he looks about 20 years younger than he really is, believe me. But he just recently celebrated a birthday that had a zero at the end of it and uh, he had a jolly good time. Anyway, I, I found it fascinating. Yeah, that, the figure before the zero is, is a very auspicious Chinese number. It's a very auspicious <laughs> Chinese number. <laughs> you can work it out. <laughs> You're all very intelligent, but it's pretty unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I can make a meal, bro. And what's what's amazing? He's just taken up a new post down at University of Kabanza, and mainly because USM didn't want him anymore. Not <laughs> typical USM. But UKM's offering you uh, quite a nice home, a stimulating environment, and Hans will go on publishing and so on. The thing I want him to do. I mean, a man who can drop in a story that says. Yeah, I was talking to this old fellow, he's on his way to Trincano, but in fact he's going to stop off to see the Rajas in 